Hello and welcome to Today in Space, the All Things Space Science Podcast. I'm your Space Science Podcast host from the East Coast, Alex Giorfanos. We're recording this here on December 13th, 2022 on planet Earth as Artemis 1 has successfully returned to Earth after a 1.4 million mile journey. We have to discuss the newly attempted skip re-entry done by Orion and why that might be valuable for humans on Artemis 2, and the first potentially, well, the first privately funded mission to potentially land on the moon just launched aboard a Falcon 9 rocket, the company iSpace out of Japan. And I'd also like to discuss my thoughts on SpaceX's latest Starlink application, the Star Shield which sounds like something out of a Marvel movie, but in fact is a tool for national defense and global surveillance. So we'll share that later in the episode. And it's on SpaceX's website right now. So if you want to go check that out, you can go look that up right now. But this is Today in Space. Thank you for joining us. Before we start on episode 291, let's thank our sponsors here, Manscaped, Estes Rockets, and as always, AG 3D Printing. Let's start with NASA Artemis 1 returning to Earth. So as we discussed, NASA's Artemis 1 mission is finally over. It's kind of surreal, especially given the fact that we attempted to see the launch back this summer in August, uh, leading into September. Multiple launch attempts were scrubbed. If you want to go check out those episodes, I did have a lot of fun, even given the fact that I didn't get to see the launch. Uh, It was a really, really great time. Met some good people. And really got to soak in the experience, and obviously, while it would have been great to have seen the launch, it was a spectacular, spectacular sight, and even a hurricane almost ruined the uh, the mission with the the rocket on the launch pad, but NASA's Artemis mission has returned home after 1.4 million miles. The Navy and NASA teams helped recover uh, the spacecraft after it splashed down off the Pacific, off the coast of Baja, California, and the USS Portland was there to pick up the spacecraft. Now, we have here this wonderful uh, swag Orion capsule. This is uh, from Lockheed Martin. It's a little foam capsule here, but it's a great demonstration of exactly what we saw on the mission. The capsule it was docked together during launch with the service module. We talked about that last episode. If you want to see what the service module did, the combination of the two spacecraft made it possible for humans. They were testing a lot of those systems. The two of them also helped to make it such a fuel-efficient and effective mission. But to return the capsule and eventually the human beings back to Earth, those two have to separate, very similar to the brother mission, the Apollo program that first went to the moon, the Artemis program and the Orion spacecraft is essentially attempting the same thing, to detach the service module from the actual command module, the capsule here, and then the capsule will send the humans back to Earth. And the most important thing, the heat shield, is what's going to help them re-enter the atmosphere. Are you looking to stuff someone's stocking this holiday season? Well, Thanks to our sponsor, Manscaped, we have the best tools to offer for either yourself or if you're buying a gift for somebody else, Manscaped has everything that you need for your holiday needs, whether it's getting the Platinum Package 4.0, it has loads of little presents, perfect for stocking stuffers, what's better than the gift of good hygiene and a few laughs? Manscaped offers a handful of of their liquid formulation, shampoos, body washes, upstairs and downstairs deodorant, gels, exfoliants, absolutely everything that they could need to keep it clean. And again, one of the things we love about Manscaped is that it makes manscaping and men's hygiene so much simpler. I mean, you can just check right here. My beard had gotten pretty crazy. I had been sick. The holidays just let it grow, and it got pretty wild. But I was able to tame the beast with the Manscaped Lawnmower 4.0. Not only do they give you the tools that you need, they help make the experience of men's grooming easier and simpler so that you don't have to overthink it. You can just grab your gear and go. But there's also things like the Shears 2.0 if you're looking for a full kit for nail care, 
with scissors, clippers, tweezers, and a file for the traveling man. There is the new Persevere Cologne, which is brings a light, breezy, woodsy feel and gives that fresh tree scent even after the holidays are over. They also have come out with their body buffer, which if you're still using a loofah that holds all that bacteria, gross, you can throw that out and get this new body scrubber, the body buffer, that feels smoother and acts tougher. And then of course, like we talked about before, the Lawnmower 4.0 is my go-to. It is the electric razor with advanced skin safe technology. It's a life changer and known for reducing nicks and cuts. Manscaped is here to make holiday shopping a blast by giving products that they'll love and make them laugh at the same time. So get 20% off and free shipping with the code SPACE at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use the code SPACE and Manscaped is the perfect gift that will be the holiday's biggest hit. So thank you, Manscaped, for being a sponsor. Really appreciate the partnership we have with them and makes a great gift for the man in your life. Might even be you. (laughs) It's okay to take care of yourself. So manscaped.com, 20% off free worldwide shipping, co-word space. Let's get back to the show. Now, Orion re-entered the atmosphere at 40,000 kilometers per hour, 25,000 miles per hour for us here in the U.S., Now, that's blazing fast, and the heat shield was able to ablate the heat. That's one of the great things about the heat shield technology that's been developed. It's not necessarily a new technology. Apollo, the space shuttle, all used heat shield technology. Starship is developing uh, heat shield tiles that can be replaceable over time, so it can be a reusable thing. Uh, They are still developing that because, obviously, that cannot fail. (laughs) That has to have enough margin and enough uh, redundancy, as we call it, to make it so that there is no issues like we had during the space shuttle era. But what's different about the Orion capsule is this skip re-entry, which was brand new and the first time this was tested. Now, the re-entry speed of 25,000 miles per hour is also a first. The the highest re-entry of a human-rated spacecraft, the heat shield did its job. But one of the reasons... It's not necessarily that the heat shield technology has progressed so far that we just put a new heat shield on there and we were able to achieve that kind of uh, slowdown in speed so that the friction hitting the atmosphere didn't destroy the thing. Now, granted, it has developed since the Apollo era, but the skip reentry was the re- key, real key here. And it's it's apparently not a new technique. This is something that was... Uh, as far far as a physics perspective, was available to them during the Apollo years, but was not available to them was the computing power and the autonomous systems that could help make the adjustments for something like this. Now, from a physics perspective, why the skip reentry is so important, we're going to go into this Time article here that is written by Jeffrey Kluger. We will have the article here available on this episode. Just like most of the things we talk about here in the episode, they will be in the description for each podcast, whether it's on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever it is, you can always look up more if you want. But the skip re-entry, the article states, re-entering the atmosphere from Earth orbit is a relatively easy thing, a matter of firing retro rockets and slowing the spacecraft's velocity below the 28,160 kilometers or 17,500 miles per hour necessary to maintain orbit. That is the speed that the International Space Station takes as it orbits the Earth so that it can stay in orbit. After that, the ship basically falls from the sky. So they had to shed roughly 7,500 miles per hour from re-entry. As it says here, returning from the moon is a different matter. In order to re-enter the atmosphere safely, the the ship must aim for a keyhole in the sky just 24 kilometers or 15 miles wide. That sounds like a mighty big target. But if the Earth was the size of a basketball and the Moon was the size of a baseball, and the two were placed 6.7 or 22 feet, uh, 6.7 meters or 22 feet apart, the relative translunar distance at that scale, the reentry target would be no thicker than a sheet of paper. Miss it, and enter too steeply, and the spacecraft would not survive the heat of reentry. Miss it and enter too shallowly, and the spacecraft will simply skip off the atmosphere and bounce back into space, something that has happened before 
although one was a very early attempt at a Mars mission, and the other was a improperly used unit conversion. Now, the Apollo re-entries were not by any means uh, a fun thing, although those astronauts were pretty crazy. Who knows? They may have enjoyed it. But 6.8 Gs is definitely not something that's fun and unfortunately is necessary if all you're doing is re-entering the atmosphere and using the heat shield to slow down. Now, Artemis 1, using the skip re-entry, basically what it does, or what it did uh, this past week, was it plunged to an altitude of 61,000 meters, or 200,000 feet, 38 miles, and it basically rolled 180 degrees after it did that, so that the future astronauts who were sitting straight up inside would now be upside down, and it would change the center of gravity of this spacecraft. And anyone who's tossed anything that is uneven in weight and seen it go up, you can tell that the center of gravity change can make a big difference, especially in the trajectory of the orbit itself. And so by doing that, by changing the center of gravity, by doing this skip procedure where they turn the spacecraft 180, it's not shallow enough for re-entry to go through the atmosphere, but enough so that it actually goes back up to 99,000 meters, or 325,000 feet, 61 miles, going back into space. And with that little parabolic maneuver, you've now made re-entry into two parts. The first one shedding off speed, the second one making a more gradual hop back into space at slower speeds, which then allows the G-forces to drop from 68 to four and reduces the amount of temperature load on the heat shield, which basically allows the material science to do what it's supposed to do. And so we can use the margins, the extra safety that NASA builds in as just that extra safety. So they don't have to stress the spacecraft out as much by just doing a simple maneuver. So the skip reentry is really a, a valuable tool for the future and I love things like this where we can make minor adjustments to over time make all of this better, right? If we're, th these are the right types of things that NASA is working on and doing and showcasing that is ultimately in the long term of, of things make it so that flight can be more routine. You know, that's one of the great things about the Apollo era and Gemini and Mercury before it that these were the people that put their lives on the line to show us what's possible. And as we've gotten now to this next stage, 50 years later, uh, we can see that things are getting better and better for the people flying there, which is going to open things up for more science and life to occur instead of the entire mission being entirely about surviving. The more that we can make things automatic, just like we do with flying through the sky and airplanes, uh, those started off as complete R&D flights, then they became military devices, and then over time, they became something that anyone could get on at any time of day by just paying for a ticket and traveling essentially anywhere in the world. Now, one day, the hope is that we will get there. But this test, this skip reentry is really cool. If you want to learn more about it, we've got this article here. Again, this time article goes a little bit more into it altogether, and... It's by Jeffrey Kluger, so thank you for that. That was uh, December 8th before the mission happened. And one of the things that did happen is that the anniversary of Apollo 17, ironically, the last moon mission, the last time that human beings were on the moon half a century ago, 1972. So on the day that they landed, December 11th, in 2022, the first mission of returning to the moon brought the spacecraft back down to Earth when... 50 years before that, Gene Cernan and Jack Smith landed Challenger in the Valley of Taurus Litro on the moon. So a, a really poetic end and beginning of another journey. And I'd like to just quote here. Uh, this is from, if you're not following Tim Gagnon on uh, anywhere on uh, social media or online, he is one of the artists for NASA, all of the, many of the patches that you'll see out there for NASA missions is Tim's work. So uh, a literal artist in the space industry, uh, someone I would love to talk to one day, 
and I've been following his, I've made friends online, and I've been following his stuff, and so the 50-year anniversary of Apollo 17 is, is near and dear to him, something we'll talk about one day when we have him on the podcast. I know he's been talking about it online, but, you know, the, the moon era that we're entering now, uh, there are people who experienced it, who grew up during the same time that many of us are experiencing it as well. And I think it's a beautiful time for us to come together and to learn from the Apollo era, because the same things that ended the Apollo era could very well end the Artemis era. And if we can learn from the past, we have a real shot at combining our Apollo-Artemis forces and making it possible so that uh, given any political challenges, funding challenges, human challenges, we may be able to actually make this a permanent change so that human spaceflight can continue without being the wi- at the whim of the change of political parties in the office and, of course, politicians and budgets. But that's not where we're going with this conversation. So this quote here is from Gene Cernan after landing on the moon. This is Bob. This is Gene. And I'm on the surface. And as I take man's last step from the surface back home for some time to come, but we believe not too long into the future, I'd like to just say what I believe history will record, that America's challenge of today has forged man's destiny of tomorrow, and as we leave the moon at Taurus Littro, we leave as we came, and God willing, as we shall return, with peace and hope for all mankind. Godspeed, the crew of Apollo 17. And I, uh, this is, again, poetic, beautiful, that those are just 50 years apart, exactly 50 years apart, the end and the beginning, the alpha and the omega, as they would say. So that's the Artemis One update. The mission has succeeded. The Orion capsule is on its way back to the Cape, and it's an amazing time. So if you have any favorite moments, please let us know on social media, Today in Space podcast on Facebook. We have our Facebook page there, Today in Space Pod on Instagram and Twitter, and Today in Space on TikTok. Email us, Today in Space Podcast at gmail.com. This podcast is brought to you by Estes Rockets. If you're looking to get a rocket for yourself uh, or anyone else in your life, especially if you have a young one and you're trying to get them into something cool or maybe they have an interest in science, Estes Rockets is a great place to have something where you can bond and enjoy the the joys of rocket science in your own backyard or or wherever you live where you're able to launch rockets so you can use our code in underscore alex to get 10 percent off at estesrockets.com it's going to help you get rockets it's not going to include sales and it's not going to include engines but it will include everything else in the store so go into estesrockets.com use our code word in underscore alex get 10 percent off things in the store and maybe you're not looking for the, the Falcon 9 rocket. I mean, look, we, we have here, we picked this up a little while ago here. This is the commemorative edition of the Saturn V rocket, which obviously is coming in real handy as we're experiencing, we're talking about this episode, the moon mission, Artemis 1. The Apollo program was obviously... Uh, a big thing and this one is actually the Apollo 11 commemorative edition which is really cool but I N underscore Alex get 10% off at Estes Rockets and uh, get something good for yourself or someone that you love uh, for the holidays and that's it folks thank you Estes Rockets for your support and for sponsoring the podcast let's get back to the show and in about 18 months we should be seeing Artemis 2 so we will definitely be preparing for that the NASA teams are already at work prepping for that And at the same time, in the same week that the Artemis 1 mission to the moon has returned, the first privately funded lunar lander mission launched on a Falcon 9 for a company called iSpace. So let's talk about that. Now, if successful, it would be the first commercial lunar lander. The only people to have ever landed on the moon at the moment are superpowers. Not even SpaceX themselves has landed on the moon yet. Although, soon with the Starship, they will attempt to. So let's learn a little bit about iSpace. The company, if you go to their website, iSpace, that's the letter I, space, dash, inc, I-N-C, dot com. They have a brief explanation here. iSpace is a lunar exploration company with a vision to extend human presence in outer space. Our vision is to expand our living sphere 
and create a sustainable world. The moon's water resources represent untapped potential. Our aspiration is to explore and develop these water resources and spearhead a space-based economy. Water can be broken down into hydrogen and oxygen to produce fuel, so we are mapping lunar resources to accelerate the pace of space development. Imagine the moon supporting construction, energy, steel procurement, communications, transportation, agriculture, medicine, tourism. We believe that by 2040, the moon will support a population of 1,000 with 10,000 people visiting every year. And if I'm checking correctly, that's in 18 years. iSpace will be instrumental in supporting life on Earth through space-based infrastructure, the company's website says. So their first step at actually launching the lander occurred with the Falcon 9. Now, the Hakuto-R mission is their first attempt at this lunar lander. And to really oversimplify it, they have launched the orbiter. And their next three steps are first to orbit the moon and do so successfully. Again, that's an oversimplification of everything that needs to happen successfully. But if they can do that, the next step is to have a soft landing on the moon. Israel just tried this recently and was unsuccessful in that part of it, in actually landing successfully. Again, the moon, not a very easy trip, especially with how much energy you need to get there in the first place. And the Israeli mission actually went slower than most missions do to offset this. But the soft landing is definitely a critical piece here. And of course, the final step is stability once landed, because a lander is no good if it's able to land but if it can't do anything afterwards, then what are we doing here? So this first mission, Hakuto-R, is to test all of that out. And there's a great infographic here go going through each of the steps. They have 10 levels of success that they're trying to do. And in that stability, that steady state that they're looking for with the system, they're going to establish steady telecommunication and power supply on the lunar surface after landing to support customer payloads surface operations. And if they are all successful in that, they may have a chance at really showing the steps of making this space-based infrastructure on the moon possible. But in typical moon fashion, it seems, especially in this uh, era of the moon, uh, the Artemis 1 mission had many attempts at the launch that were scrubbed or pushed off for other things happening. There were leaks, there was an engine possibility having uh, engine issue possibility. There were hurricanes. There was a lot that went, <laughs> uh, you could say, wrong leading up to the mission. But the mission itself went so right. Now, the Hakuto R mission is following that same trajectory if you rule that as part of success. The SpaceX team tried to launch this mission multiple times and had to delay something wrong with the rocket, windows closing, weather not being successful uh, enough for launch. But one of the great things about being able to launch at such a heavy cadence is that means that if something doesn't go right the first time, you're able to have those second and third attempts very quickly. So it didn't become the months-long saga that, say, the Artemis mission had become with the delays. Now, all that being said, it's very exciting to see an actual moon mission launch aboard a Falcon 9. You know, one of the things that the Falcon 9 was kind of always beat up on online by other space interests uh, where the Falcon 9 didn't uh, was, was competition was that the Falcon 9 is not the biggest performing rocket. You know, there are other rockets that have bigger performance. And... In some ways, bigger is not always better, especially when it comes down to the fact that space is at such a place where the cost of missions is super important. Hakuto R, iSpace, as a company, they were one of five winners of the Lunar X Prize. So to think about what the time of winning that X Prize, or being a finalist for the Lunar X Prize, the world was not in a place when that was happening for these launches to happen as quickly as they were. And with a rocket system like the Falcon 9, a reusable platform, the amount of attempts that you get versus the amount of money you actually spend for that mission, I mean, for companies and missions trying to happen in today's world, this is a time that hasn't existed ever in space. So 
this is a cool mission to follow. We will be seeing as this progresses. They actually have some great stuff here on the iSpace website if you want to follow the mission along. So far, they're two days and 17 hours into the mission, and there's a lot more to go. So best of luck to the iSpace team, uh, an international team with people all over the planet working together. Uh, some folks who I've met online who left to make a career here and to think that they're now <laughs> one of the key players for this lunar lander, this first private lunar lander, uh, seems like the, it was the right move to make. So congrats to the iSpace team. We're definitely interested to see where the Hakuto R mission goes and best of luck with a soft landing and stable comms afterwards. And to close out this episode, what I'd like to do is share some thoughts from an engineer, uh, an episode that we've done a few times over the years, essentially uh, just sharing my thoughts on the topic. Uh, it is, I'll, I'll share the some of the facts about it, and then I'll share my opinion in the hopes that it helps stir up a discussion that helps you engage and send us what you think about it. Um, a, a, a show and tell as far as thoughts and ideas on a certain topic. We're living in the world with with war and calamity and chaos, and we're seeing space get involved in military conflicts more and more, although military conflicts in space are part of its uh, genesis with the space race and the V2 rocket before that that led up to this. So... Space is definitely not shy or not uh, separate from military operations and national defense. Most of the astronauts that have been up there have been servicemen and women. And now the private space company, SpaceX, has taken another dip into the space military with their new offering of Starlink. So Starlink, for those that are new to SpaceX's global satellite uh, network. This global satellite network is was created to provide internet around the world, especially to those remote areas where getting the fiber optic cables from land or from across the ocean were just not possible. So Starlink has already started to make some big waves around the world. Not only is it providing a service to people that haven't had it before, it's starting to get on planes, trains, and automobiles, cruise ships. Very soon, T-Mobile may even be offering Starlink as part of the, what is their Magenta program or whatever there. Just, you know, I have T-Mobile as well. It was a nice surprise to find out that I may be able to have Starlink with the service I already have. <laughs> but essentially, it's becoming a commodity and something that's being used in a commercial sense. In this past year, Starlink has been deployed in natural disasters around the planet, and lately, in this past year, it was also used in the fight on uh, in Ukraine with Russia and against Russia. The satellites have been used in a theater of war unlike they've ever been before. You know, the Starlink dishes were provided to the people of Ukraine. Uh, if you were following along on Twitter as this was happening, essentially the Starlink receivers were being tracked by Russian soldiers, and they were being attacked. So people were being told to leave their Starlink dishes away from where they actually were and then get the internet to run cables so that they could they could be able to access it from a distance. Uh, Russia was also attempting to jam the satellites and SpaceX being a software company as well, making all of their stuff in-house, essentially, uh, they have the ability to make adjustments on the fly. And on the battlefield, Starlink has been a uh, kind of a, a very underrated advantage. And from a technology perspective, uh, it opens up a whole nother aspect to the point where now the Starlink is going to be created in a national defense variant called Starshield. Now, we said before that it sounds just like something out of a Marvel movie, and it honestly is not too far off from that plot line. So if you go to SpaceX.com Starshield, you can see it's supporting national security. 
secured satellite network for government entities. Starshield leverages SpaceX's Starlink technology and launch capability to support national security efforts. While Starlink is designed for consumer and commercial use, Starshield is designed for government use with an initial focus on three areas. Earth observation. Starshield launches satellites with sensitive payloads and delivers processed data directly to the user. Communications, where Starlink provides assured global communications to government users with Starshield user equipment. And it also provides hosted payloads, where Starshield builds satellite buses to support the most demanding customer payload missions. So essentially, the Starlink satellite and that global network can now have a government entity version where they'll be able to provide the government with their own technology and security efforts from orbit. Now, there's a lot of things to get into here. I, myself, have to be very cautious, or or, or my, hmm, how should I say this? With no disrespect, I have so much respect and admiration for the human beings that put their life on the line to defend the country. Uh, It's something that I myself didn't feel a calling to, but as I learn more and more from veterans who speak more and more about what they know of, Jocko Willink, Navy SEAL, and then there's also folks like David Goggins, who their stories and the other veterans that they speak to Uh, To hear their stories puts my life into so much perspective, and I have such an appreciation for what they've offered all of us, especially here in America. All of that said, it seems that in, in my own lifetime that war is something that can be started very easily and is really hard to stop. So I approach this star shield idea with a bit of caution. I do realize that there's definitely a use for space in the domain of war. And I'm not naive enough to say that it's not like this whole thing that we have a podcast about is hasn't been available because of that as well. But when we start talking about Earth observation and communications and hosted payloads, uh... I have more questions, so I definitely want to discuss more with folks that may understand this a little bit better. We may be speaking with the folks over at Embedded Ventures again to discuss global comms and and what something like this means, but also to chat more about what the industry already has. I mean, SpaceX wouldn't be getting into this business if there wasn't already a business available. And we've talked to a few people with different companies uh, and military applications, really, if, if we're talking about what has kept the space program alive as America figured out their human space travel initiative to get to the point where Artemis One has returned to Earth, it's the military applications that has kept that going. Now, obviously, we hope it's more than that, and it, it is at its core about venturing into space and exploring and finding out more about humanity but also resources and all those other things. We can't just have a complete land grab out there where people are grabbing resources. And and the more and more we get into the future here as SpaceX succeeds more and more, pushing the entire industry and the entire world towards a future where space becomes more affordable and thus more people can have access to it, um, just like we have a an Air Force and a Navy and the Army, we have the Space Force now. And while, you know, originally it was very easy to joke about it, it is the Space Force that is involved in all these launches and was involved in uh, this last, you know, Hakuto R mission and the return. Like we said, the Navy was helping Artemis One come back. So uh, it, it's, it's a complex subject. I honestly have a uh, a not so great feeling about it um, but I'll also be honest that I don't know enough about it to know where is the line that should be crossed and what are other countries doing and 
Is this just another step forward in trying to have global relations where, as we saw with the Space Force's early uh, review, we did an episode talking about the futures of space that the Space Force saw, the idea of the Star Shield, it plays key into that mentality of allowing everybody to have the ability to launch into space and not have a future where, one, space becomes so uninteresting that nobody launches except for a few military missions, but also where another country may decide to end space travel for all of us and uh, allow some type of Kessler effect where a bunch of satellites get destroyed, as we've seen multiple payload destruction demonstrations where we're now still categorizing debris from those explosions that all space operations are having to go around right so the the if we don't have any kind of guidance or people monitoring that stuff uh it could be it could get so bad that nobody has access to space the question is is how close to the line of everyone has a has a chance at the final frontier like how close are we to that is it is it just word service or is this actually something that's good for everybody so uh i i'm asking really what what do you think is this something that you're concerned about do you think it's a great thing do you think it's a bad thing um are you agnostic do you do you not think it's a problem at all um or does it not bother you in the slightest. I would love to know. Hit us up on social media. Email us at Tiny Space Podcast. I'd love to know. We'd love to read your answers here on the podcast in the future. But I will definitely be looking for someone to talk to about this uh, so we can ask more questions and get their opinion on it and really chew on this because this is an example of how I feel the momentum uh, is shifting. Now, is do I think ultimately it's good for long-term progress in space and making it so that we have that future that NASA is talking about where we have long sustained uh, human presence. It's something that uh, SpaceX is built upon. It's something that iSpace is built upon. Uh, Do we need solid military presence in space in order for that future to exist? Uh, It seems like the obvious answer is yes, but uh, I am optimistically cautious at just saying a uh, blatant yes without questioning uh, where the, the line actually is. Uh, and so that's my thought for this week. I'd love to know what you think. Uh, and if you have anyone you think we should talk to about this, please let us know. But that's it for this, re- this week's episode, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, episode 291. We should have two more episodes at least this year. And we're looking forward to it. We'll close out the year with a little bit of a year in review. But um, that's it, folks. Very exciting. Artemis 1 has returned. We have all of these missions going around the moon. And something we'll probably talk about next episode is another mission uh, called Dear Moon, which has finally uh, chosen the folks that will be on board. And it's going to be a really interesting mission. But... Starship has to get to orbit first, so we're looking forward to that, and we hope you are too. Have a great rest of your week. Spread love and spread science. Live long and prosper, and have a great rest of your week. Thanks for joining us. 